Greetings, we'll say this is Professor Maynu M. Pim coming to you from Juba, South Sudan. And I'm glad to uh, receive the honor of being able to share with you some of my insights over the years regarding uh, the theme that, that um, the community has chosen for this 42nd anniversary of the Open Church. And I'm honored to be able to address this uh, issue of the 42 principles of Ma'at, the foundation of our future. I think it's an excellent uh, theme, concept, and title. And I am going to be able to address this. And in fact, I'm in South Sudan as I'm on a current primary research tour to partly address that question about the principle of Ma'at not just a principle in Kemet, but even going beyond that to look at the ostrich feather that Ma'at is symbolized by. And then the broader question is why not only the ostrich feather, but the ostrich bird itself, which has been fundamentally integrated in the culture in Kemet, but not just in Kemet, but the entire region. So in the brief time that I have, I'll... Um, I'll, I'll address this and hopefully give you some insight that can be not only historical, but practical for the Wolsey community as we move forward. So we'll look at the concept of Ma'at and Kemet, the significance of the feather, the importance of the ostrich bird, and also I'll end by addressing the issue of Wolsey and Ma'at. And then um, hopefully we'll be able to present enough that you can move forward with on a practical basis. But there's nothing more important than this great concept of Ma'at. And so that's what um, uh, I'll be addressing. And I'm glad that this topic was chosen because uh, it's right up my alley, something that I've been pursuing now for years to really understand, not, on a con not only on a conceptual level, but a really deep level to understand how and why it was integrated so thoroughly into the classical African cultural tradition. And so let me show some slides to put this in context and hopefully give you some new ideas about the concept that many of us have heard about for quite some time and that's Ma'at. So again, the theme of the 42 um, you know, laws or principles of Ma'at, the foundation of our future. And so obviously I don't have to um, say a lot about my work over the years, but I have done quite a bit of extensive field work in the uh, over the last two decades, uh, last three decades on this topic in a couple dozen countries. So Ma'at is the great principle that uh, is the overriding principle that governs everything in the region in terms of, of the most important rituals, ceremonies, and uh, and ideas. So. The goddess Ma'at, as you see here, Ma'at is the, the law. It's Ma'at that govern in every arena. It's Ma'at that govern the universe. And, and uh, here you have an image of Ma'at. Here Ma'at is presented, as you, can, uh, as you can see. And it's the text, the Medu Nature text here says that Ma'at is the daughter of Ra the daughter of Ra, of God. So the firstborn of the creator was the law, Ma'at. And they chose to represent this great law of the cosmos as a woman with an ostrich feather. And this is not just chosen at random, but it's chosen very specifically as we look at this, uh, this powerful image of the goddess Ma'at, which represents divine law and truth and justice. This is the, uh, the highest possible law. It really is. It's the uh, supreme law. And so when Ma'at governs in the universe, it's Ma'at that kept the planets in their orbit. It's Ma'at that's responsible for the alternation of the day and night. It's Ma'at that keeps things in, in order, not only on the cosmic level, but also in the natural world. Everything is in its proper place and plays its proper role because of the principle, the great principle of Ma'at. It's Ma'at that's responsible for the balance and the harmony and the proportion. 
This is the fundamental basis of Ma'at in the natural world, but it doesn't stop there. It's also in the world of the, the living, in the human community. Ma'at is the elevated notion of moral perfection. It's the elevated notion of moral perfection. And Ma'at is that fundamental symbol that governs behavior where people are expected to think Ma'at, do Ma'at, speak Ma'at, have Ma'at become a intuitive part of their behavior and conduct where their conduct is based on truth and justice and right order and, and balance and harmony and the great principle of reciprocity. That's what Ma'at's about. It's divine law that operates among the human community, but it doesn't only stop there. Among the living community, Ma'at also is the concept that, that travels to the spirit world and governs the duat, the place of spiritual transformation Ma'at is in, in, uh, in control of that area as well. So it's a broad concept that was not just an abstract idea, but is practiced in the living community. And when people pass on to the spirit world, Ma'at governs there as well. It's a powerful symbol, fundamentally integrated into the day-to-day -day conduct of the people. And this is what's uh, significant about, um, about this great principle of Ma'at. In addition to this, so if, if, if you look at the human community, is that everybody was bound by and had to follow Ma'at. So here you have Seti the first among many kings and all kings as they are installed, they're given their crown, they're given their, uh, their ability and authority to rule. And then you see in the next scene, here you have Seti in front of an altar who is offering what? He's offering Ma'at that he's going to rule according to the law. He's not above the law. He is bound by the law. And he's presenting Ma'at, the great goddess, to the Holy Trinity, the first known trinity in the history of humanity, of Asar, Aset, and Heru. And notice that they are in a shrine. This is an enclosed shrine, and he is presenting this great concept to them because this is what he must rule by. This is significant because he's ruling not according to his own ideas, his own whims or whatever he thinks. It's not like that. He must be bound by the law. Now, this is completely different than what we see in, let's say, England, for example. In England, the kings ruled by what they call divine right. It was their divine right to rule and they answered to nobody other than God and God was themselves. So this, so this is why they can be imperialist and vicious people masquerading as some great leaders, but divine rule in England, it simply meant that they were not accountable to anybody other than themselves. That's fundamentally different than what you see here in Kemet in classical Africa, but that even the king is bound by the law. And in the, the spirit realm, in the place of the duat, in tombs, and the duat is a place of, of spiritual transformation, you have the same thing. It's Ma'at that governs. Here you have the King Ramses III. He's presenting Ma'at. This is what he's governed by, and this is what governs the entire region of the Duat. Uh, these 12 hours of the night that are depicted in the tombs. So he's presenting the great principle. And here you, you see this is Ma'at, the woman with the ostrich feather, and some destructive clown. Some destructive clown has destroyed some of the imagery here, uh, chipped away the face, but still you can see the great principle of Ma'at, her fundamental symbol, the feather in front of an altar being presented. And you find that everywhere. Here you have the king presenting Ma'at to Asar. It's everywhere. It's the, it's the, it's the great principle that governs every, every arena, including the judgment scene. You all have seen the judgment scene. This scene is not just for those that have passed on and crossed over or transitioned to the spirit world. Uh, there's at least uh, one or more text that also says that this judgment scene and this important moment of the two truths where the person is either going to go in the right direction or the direction of punishment. But this scene here is also for those who are upon the earth, meaning the living. So here you have the initiate. He's not always a deceased person. He's the initiate. He's in his ceremonial white outfit, the linen outfit. He's being led by Anpu. 
the, the great deity here that um, is significant in this realm. And we know that he's a high power because of the hump. But here at the judgment scene, you see on the scale, this is symbolically the heart of the initiate. And, we, and, and, and on the right scale is the feather of ma'at. So the goal is to make sure that there's balance between a person's heart, a person's being, and this great principle. Now we know in reality, a heart weighs about 10 ounces versus a feather that weighs less than an ounce. So how could they balance? It's a conceptual idea that a person has to have a light heart in order to be successful. A light heart means that the, piece, the person has to live an honorable life, a respectable life, a life based on Ma'atian principles, not as some general abstract concept, but as a day-to-day -day practice. And the person now is at the judgment where he or she has to say out loud what they've done and to give the 42 declarations of innocence. And, and, and it must be truthful. So Jehuti is writing down exactly what this person is saying and what the reality is. And the beast, Amit, this is a composite animal with a crocodile head, lion's body, and then the tail of a, of, a, of a hippo. So this is a composite animal, Amit, who's ready to, who's, who's watching carefully and listening to exactly what's being recorded at this initiation ceremony. And if the person is, is, is not truthful, if he's not Ma'a Karu or true of voice, if he's not speaking truthfully, then Amit will eat his heart and end his existence to annihilate the person. So this is what he is uh, anxiously looking at and observing. So the person has to say and give the 42 declarations of innocence before these assessors here. There's 42 assessors of Ma'at to assess if what is being said is true. So the person has to say, I've not stolen. I've not taken milk from the mouth of babies. I've not defrauded the sacred offerings. I've not caused anyone to weep. I've not been sexually impure. I've not eavesdropped. And there's a, there's a whole list of 42 comprehensive uh, set of values that this person has to say, I've not done those things. I'm a righteous person. I don't have to be told thou shall not do this or thou shall not do that. That's for naughty people. Those are people who are spiritually off base who have to be told and scolded and warned. And the concept in Kemet, completely different. The person is righteous and the person will say that I've not done these things. It doesn't mean that a person has not made a mistake. It doesn't mean that they have not made an error. When they say I've not uh, stolen, I've not taken milk from the mouth of babies, I've not uh, defrauded sacred offerings. What they mean by that is that I've not made it a habit. That's what they mean. And here, the initiate is successful. His heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at. It is found to be true as he is before, humbly before the 42 assessors. And then you see him in the next scene being presented to, to Asar, who judges the entire scene because he's the first person to die and be resurrected uh, in this great elaborate concept. So this initiate as he faces the, the, the hall of two truths, he's all he's shown successful. And this is normally the case to shown successful is a positive outlook, but a person must be truthful in order to be successful in that realm. And it is Ma'at that judges, that is the fundamental foundation to judge if the heart is light. Now, if a person is lying and they've lived a life as a scoundrel, as a low level person, as somebody with shaky character, shady character, that cannot be trusted, that lies on a regular basis, who, whose name brings forth a foul odor. Well, if a person is saying, I've not uh, murdered anyone, I've not been uh, impure when they, uh, and I've not spoken uh, uh, falsely. When a person mentions that, if they are lying, then they will have a heavy heart. So there will never be balance in the scale of someone is, is, uh, is untruthful. So the way in which the scales were balanced is the initiate is truthfully saying, I've not done these things, so they have a light heart. They're not burdened down with guilt because they know that they're lying. And so he's passed this important 
judgment past Ammon and Jehudi records and he's and he's being successfully shown in the next uh in the next scene and so mod is very significant now for those that that don't succeed the people that operate on a very low level there's a price to pay there's a lake of fire and you see a lot of people in the lake of fire who uh, seem to be struggling and here you have Amit again ready to devour the person and end their existence and what's governing it? The feather of Ma'at. So those that are going to be uh, annihilated, they are presented in this kind of scene as dark beings. And they are upside down people. Literally, they are, they are described in the text as upside down. And they are described in the imagery. Shown in the imagery as upside down. So a person has to resist doing the opposite of what is uh, about health and life. And that is, you have to be upright. But the persons who pay a price because of bad character and they did not uh, follow Ma'at and they did not successfully pass the judgment, those are upside down people who drink urine and eat feces. And they're literally upside down. So the goal is to never become an upside down person and to live in that kind of detestable state until Amit ends a person's existence. These are people that we, that pass on and we never, hear about again because they contributed nothing positive to the family they contributed nothing positive to the community and these are the people that are represented in um, this area where they are destroyed by Ammon. now on the other hand at this great judgment <clears throat> what the goal is is to become an ak a k h to become an act an act is a is a, um, a glorious spirit. An Ak is an elevated being. An Ak is an elevated ancestor. We talk generally about ancestors. No, there's ranks of ancestors, just like there's ranks of people in the living world, like you have respected elders and you just have older people. They're not the same. They never have been and never will be. A respected elder we give deference to, but an older person who just happens to live a little longer than a lot of other folks, who's a drunkard, who's a thief, who's a liar, who's a, a creator of mischief. These people will just give them some respect as being an older person, but they never, these older people will never get the deference of a respected elder who lives the best of the community values, never. And so when one passes on, they don't just become an ancestor that they're all in the same rank, no. The, scoundrel, the older person who lived a bad life, they just become a dead relative. That's it. Nothing more than that. And they're soon forgotten by most people. Most don't even know they had a funeral. But on the other hand, the respected elder who represents the best values of the community, they become a respected ancestor. And among that group, you have people that are elevated. In Kemet, they call them an ak. And there's many stila, like a wooden um like uh plaques of a person's achievement we call it like a tombstone today and you have these plaques with uh, an ak you know sometimes there could be a couple that are both ox that ak is an elevated ancestor someone of, of high powerful status that is highly respected people even wrote letters to the ak to help them to resolve conflict among the living they write letters to the ak to ask them to bring about the rain or bring about uh, more specifically the overflow of the Nile to help resolve conflict, to bring about <clears throat> the birth of a healthy baby. It, and Ak can do that according to the people in Kemet. So this scene <clears throat> is not just some symbolic scene, but it's something that's quite practical for the people in Kemet and will do well to learn how all of this works, at least some of it, the foundation. And so one other thing is that while this takes place, the person, when they become a respected ancestor and an ak, is you know they've gone through a series of rituals, in court, uh, including the opening of the mouth ceremony, where the person's passed on, and literally there's a ritual to have the person be able to 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 eat again, to be able to see again, smell again, hear again, so that they're operating in the spirit realm and they have their faculties in place. This is what happens when a person has gone through the important rights successfully um, and become a respected 
ancestor, but an Ak is somebody at a at a very, very powerful level. And on the other hand, Amit will take care of those who deserve to be taken care of because they didn't follow Ma'at. And it's important to know that Ma'at is just not some nice concept of truth and justice and right order and balance and reciprocity and harmony is more than that. It's the law. And to create harmony and balance, one must be active to pursue uh, disharmony, to pursue chaos and throw it on his back on the ground. So you see Ma'at on a regular and consistent basis taking care of those that were outside of the law. Here she is, Ma'at, with her, her classic feather, as we see. But more than that, you see uh, the unk. And notice the, notice the rope tying together a number of enemies. They're tied around their neck, and their hands are tied behind their back. These are people on their knees. So you don't really see their legs because they're subdued. This is Ma'at in action. This is not some anomaly. This is the broad aspect of Ma'at, to govern the conduct of the people. So we can do no better than to recognize that Ma'at demands that we address injustice, that we address groups or people that are out of order or out of line, even in our own ranks. You're not doing anybody in any favor by being silent in the face of, of wrong conduct and wrong actions and uh, destructive speech in our community. You're not doing anybody any favor and you're certainly not practicing ma'at if you ignore these things just to, to go along, just to get along. That's not how ma'at operated in the arguably the highest level development of African classical civilizations of which we know. This is a high level development, high level civilization and they put in the middle a great concept of human conduct to keep everybody in line where they're expected to practice and do and speak ma'at on a regular basis, even confronting those that are out of order and making them pay a price, as you see here. And it's a, one thing to also point out is that ma, ma'at is so special as a, as a practical concept is very different than what you find, let's just say, in Greece. In the Greek culture, they don't have anything equivalent to ma'at, the great principle of, con of, uh, of righteous and, uh, conduct. They have DK. This is the goddess DK here, and she only represents, she just represents order and what's customary. That's what DK represents, uh, just conventional rules. DK doesn't have any moral value. So while they'll while DK focuses on the conventional rules and order and, and norms, but there doesn't have to be righteousness or justice, just like the US system today. We have a criminal, criminal justice system. So when people are running around talking about law and order, yeah, there's law and order, but what about righteousness? <laughs> what about what about truth? Those are not a part of this law and order mentality. This is similar to what you find in DK. It doesn't incorporate the idea of righteous conduct. It's just to keep things in order and conventional law. They didn't have, so you have to try to integrate a number of different ideas in uh, the European ancient culture of Greece in order to, to match or even be even discussed in the same level, on the same level as the great all encompassing principle of Ma'at. So it's not just law and order, but it's also truth and righteousness, which fundamentally distinguishes the African system of, of, um, of governance and practice from the foreigners who uh, had no real concept. They had no overriding concept of truth and justice uh, along with law and order in an all-encompassing idea in principle. Now, in Kemet, we know about uh, Ma'at and this important practice, but it's not just in Kemet. In the entire Nile Valley region, it's the same idea about the ostrich feather, but not just the Nile Basin where I'm doing research. This is where I'm at now. I'm in, uh, I'm in the deep area of South Sudan. But this entire region, they see the ostrich feather as the, as the preeminent symbol of authority. But also, 
on this current field research, primary research tour, I've spent a lot of time in the Omo Valley, in the Ethiopian area, and it's the same idea, the same concept. And even though these groups are, are quite distinct, even though there's some family overlap um, from these groups, but at the same time, they're distinct, yet they all have the same, literally the same idea, the same elevated respect for the ostrich feather and is worn by only the most important people. And Kemet, the ostrich feather, worn by the king and high priest in important ceremonies. That's where they wear the ostrich feather, when you see the important ceremonies. But also in, um, in the Omo Valley and the, the Nile Valley, that's what they use it for today. The chiefs, the kings, respected elders, and, uh, and special heroes in the society, they're able to wear the ostrich um, feather to represent the law and the most significant ideas. So for example, if we look at uh, ancient Kush, <clears throat> and then we, I'll show you some modern examples, but we look at ancient Kush. And if you take a look at this scene from Kush, and by the way, the heartland of Kush was based right here in Sudan area and, um, and this is where the Kushite kings ruled from in a vast Kushite kingdom that included uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Egypt, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Eritrea, uh, Somalia, and even across the Red Sea into Yemen and Saudi Arabia. This was a part of the old Kushite empire. Here you're seeing high level Kushite individuals from, from um, classical Kush. And notice that you have what? The ostrich feather because these are very high ranking individuals, very significant. This is why they're able to wear the ostrich feather thousands of years ago. It's the most important symbol for them as it was in Kemet. And notice the hairstyles. We'll talk about that in another place, but this is the hair styles that's used today in this area by the Dinka, the Madari. They use it, so they use cow urine to dye the hair. So by, based on my field research, I can identify specific groups that are represented in the art in Kemet and not just the general terms that most people are um, using. They just say uh, th these are Southerners or Nilotics or some ridiculous people still talking about what well, these are the Negroes. No, nah, well, they all are African, ain't no Negro. It's, uh, so instead of Negroid, we talk about Africoid, but I can identify specific groups and that's part of my field work. But anyway, you see the ostrich feather there. You see the ostrich feather. These are high-ranking individuals of extremely importance. And they are bringing the most important cows. So this like uh, where I was yesterday. One cow with these special spots is equal to 30 normal cows. 30, literally. You sell one of these, you get 30. And um, that's it. Notice this. Notice the ostrich feather. So it's not just Ma'at, but it's, it's uh, in Kush, you see it in the entire region. And this is important to know is that it's a, it's a idea that permeates all these different cultures, but it's not just the ostrich feather. When we think about Ma'at, it's also the egg itself. So among the literally the oldest artifacts that you'll find in Kemet in the pre-dynastic period before the first dynasty, is you see an ostrich egg in an image of an ostrich. But ostrich eggs are most uh, ancient of the artifacts that you'll find from the entire region because of the significance of not just the feather, but the ostrich bird and the egg. So it's both of these that are very significant. Let me give you an example. In the Omo Valley area, in, in among the Kansu, this group, among all of the other groups, they have so much respect for the ostrich. So in the Kansu, which has a tremendous uh, system of governance, uh, they have a very sophisticated and significant system that we will draw, I'll address that when I publish my work. But the, the ostrich egg is literally put on top of the most important house in the entire village, which is the Mora. The Mora is a community house. And you see some of the elder men here, they hang out at the, at the Mora. And on top of the Mora is none other than an ostrich egg to represent the significance of that building. 
So on top of the mora and the king's or the chief's house, you find the ostrich egg. And this is what's happening today. There's a link between the past going back to classical African uh, civilizations and the current living communities, even among, or I should say also among the destinies. This is a group in Southern Ethiopia, right near the Kenyan border. And here they are practicing or participating in the Demi ceremony. This is a rites of passage uh, ceremony for young girls and boys. And here you have the men and women, the brothers and sisters performing the Demi, which is a very significant ceremony. And, um, but they have the ostrich plumes, the ostrich feathers for the, for you see the men here during this important Demi ceremony. And then notice also some of the older or respected women, what are they wearing? The ostrich feather, but it's only for the most significant and important people in that particular culture. So this idea continues about the significance of the ostrich feather uh, in the region. And you see these brothers here, you see the, the leopard skin outfit, but notice this is not their hair. This is the feathers from the ostrich. These are very significant high level people among the decimates. Also the hammer. Here I'm speaking with and interviewing Chief Bidey from the hammer. And he's explaining the significance of, um, of the ostrich bird and why they use and how they use the ostrich feather as well. And he's explaining this, this is the, the home of the chief. And I had a chance to stay in the village to learn their ways. It was a great welcoming. Uh, this, was, this was a few years ago, um, but learning about the special bird has been my mission for a while, here it is. Again, you see them, these men standing in front of uh, the chief's house. And um, what is the chief uh, wearing? Well, he is wearing the ostrich, <clears throat> the ostrich feather here. And so is this elder. So this is very significant how they use the ostrich feather even today, as we go further and further up south to Uganda, you have the current king of, of Buganda, uh, Ronald Mutebi uh, II, he's wearing what? The ostrich feather. So it's the modern practice that links to the ancient practice where the entire area, as I showed earlier and said earlier, that they see the significance of the ostrich feather representing the per people of the highest stature. So the question is, what about this ostrich bird? Why did they choose the ostrich? This was my fundamental and remains the fundamental question is why the ostrich? There's many birds, many birds around. Why do you all use the ostrich? If we know the, the reasons today of why these groups use the ostrich feather and why the ostrich bird is so special to them, then it helps to explain what we see in classical Kemet. So instead of just mentioning my aunt in general, as an idea or general concept, we know specifically because in Kemet, we have the images of Ma'at that I showed. There's the metal nature inscription that we can read, but there's nobody around today performing the rituals in, in ancient Kemet. There's nobody around today that we can interview. So what we do and what I do as a researcher is take the data and the details from the past and to help illuminate the current practices. So as I watch ceremonies and rituals and ask the chiefs and kings and, and respected elders and heroes about the ostrich bird, they give insight that they know from their own experience and observation. So for example, throughout the region, the people agree that this, they say that the ostrich is a special bird. Some have called it a holy bird. And here, um, and, and they say it's a very, very, very humble bird, very humble. It's unique. The ostrich does not fly. This is an African bird with unique characteristics. And the ostrich is very, very tall. Some ostriches are seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, and they can run with tremendous speed over 40 miles an hour, literally over 40 miles. They've been clocked at 43 miles an hour and it's so graceful. So the people throughout the region they make it very clear that this is the single greatest bird anywhere in the Nile Valley or the Omo Valley. It's the single greatest bird of all the birds. 
And what I learned and what they, the, the informers told me consistently is that they choose the ostrich, not only because they like the feathers, the feathers are, in, uh, are durable, which is true. The ostrich actually sheds a lot of feathers and I have a number of them and they're in different conditions in my off and different off my college office, my home office. And uh, I have these ostrich feathers and they don't decay. They don't become brittle. You know, they don't fall apart. So they like it for that basic reason. But they say that the ostrich is tall and sees far and that the chief must be like the ostrich, must have vision, must be able to see far to be able to, to, to look at the landscape and to see danger. It's the chief's role to have that kind of uh, far vision. They say that that's one of the reasons is that it's the exceptional vision of the ostrich. They also consistently say that the ostrich has great stamina, that this bird can run at high speeds for a long time, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The ostrich is running it may not be the fastest of all of the animals. You know, we know the cheetah can run fast, but the ostrich is, has great stamina. You know, it, so the lion and others, they don't have that kind. They have a burst of speed, but the ostrich can run at high speeds for a very long time. And so it's the great stamina of the bird. They say that this is very significant in leadership, that there's great vision, that there's great stamina. They also report um, interesting details. They all pretty much say that the ostrich as a great ability to calculate that the ostrich is outrunning the rain is how they consistently describe the ostrich ability to, you know, to escape uh, an uncomfortable situation. And the ostrich calculates distances very well and outruns the rain. They also indicate that the ostrich is a great protector. I mean, what an idea for a, a leader, a, a chief or in our context, a president or a minister or some leader is that when there's a fire, you know, there's natural fires that break out, the ostrich, they say, is able to calculate, go to water and then keep the water in its wings. So when the ostrich goes back to those chicks, the ostrich is able to keep the chicks wet and, and safe. And also they indicate that the area around the chicks, the ostrich makes sure that there's no brush, that it's kind of open dirt around those chicks so that the brush fire, um, it, it, so this, this dirt kind of insulates them. And they talk about this being a great protector of the chicks during a time of crisis as a symbol of great leadership. Not only that, but they say that, that this bird is, uh, is, is very, very special and able to protect when necessary, has a powerful kick. And, they, and, and the ostrich gallops at such a tremendous, uh, graceful pace, but the, 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 the steps could be 15 feet apart. So they observe all these different things about the ostrich and they make this the most special bird, a holy bird, a bird above all others that represents leadership. And this is what they report about the, the ostrich and its, its significance in the entire region. And, and they're not getting this from anybody else. It's from careful, long-term observations because the groups don't care about what anybody else thinks. They don't care about any, what anybody else thinks or about anybody else's culture at all. So when I'm interviewing these elders and chiefs and, um, and these heroes among them, they, uh, they're talking about their observations. And that's what's so important. Now, also, when I say hero, a hero is somebody who's a part of a hunting team or, uh, and they're able to track and hunt an ostrich, for example, which is very rare to do. They say that they can only track and hunt an ostrich successfully is when the ostrich is eating. And then it's a little bit more vulnerable when it's eating. But other than that, it's like, it's very, very difficult. Notice this ostrich and the flexibility. I was able, when I was, saw the ostrich at this game park, he's like almost like a giraffe eating fruit from the tree. But what a flexible bird. But the bird is, is significant today, but it's significant in Kemet. Here is the fan of Tutankhamen, King Tut. And what is he doing? He's hunting the ostrich. Yeah, this is, a, this is an ostrich hunt. So the fans that he used, the actual fans, 
that ostrich bird feathers would be used for those fans. But here he is on a on an ostrich hunt to give you an idea of how significant it would be. So again, no one's going around killing a lot of ostriches because it's very difficult to do. But this is the most important and the most significant bird. This is what my art is based on. They carefully chose this bird to represent the greatest possible law in antiquity. And so it represents leadership because of the, what I mentioned earlier. So if we look at how does this relate to us in any kind of way, um, well, it's to have vision. A leader must have vision, a leader must have balance and stamina. And this is what the ostrich represents. And this is why they chose the bird to represent the chiefs and kings in this entire region. And everybody has the same view, which is absolutely amazing. So it's about the bird and its characteristics. But when we look at Ma'at itself, it's about accountability. As I showed you, Ma'at holds people accountable. So a real leader is someone who holds him or herself accountable and holds other people accountable, even when it's uncomfortable. Ma'at, you never see Ma'at presented in a way where injustice endures and strives around Ma'at, not at all. Ma'at pursues injustice and throws it on his back on the ground. How about that kind of leadership? where you have leadership that will take control. And that's one of the things that the chiefs consistently mentioned to me, and that is that a wise chief, a wise leader gets collective input from the council, from the village, but once a decision is made, that's it. That's it, there's, not, there's no more discussion. That's the law, that's, that's how it works. And they don't go back on their decision. And they mentioned this about the ostriches, that the ostriches makes firm decisions. And uh, it's amazing how they know the intricate details of, uh, of, the, uh, of the bird, but it's, uh, it's important to be able to um, hold officials accountable, uh, officials accountable, ministers accountable, council of elders, and regular members. Because if so, then we are really and truly practicing ma'at. Ma'at is not just a concept where we're all friends, we all get, get along all the time. No, in any kind of community, there's challenges, there's difficulties. And when that happens, then the leaders step up and they practice the principles that they profess. So the principle of Ma'at is the principle that we are embracing. And um, it's important that the 42 uh, principles are, are laid out. And by the way, the number 42 is because there were 42 sepots or 42 districts in Kemet. So there was a power associated with mine in each of the districts. So it has to operate everywhere, every arena, every commission, um, every circle, every location where we have, we'll say, and have these structures in place. If we're following the great principle of Ma'at and the 42 laws, they must operate all the time. And everybody has to be held accountable, as you saw with kings, with rulers, chiefs, everybody, if they're out of order, then Ma'at demands that they be approached and their behavior be directed and corrected. So this is a basic overview I wanted to give you about the 42 laws of Ma'at and how that could be a foundation. And so for me, it's always about not just the idea and the concept, but where did it come from? And it's interesting and insightful to see how it was integrated into the classical African tradition and it's still being used today to govern the rural societies and rural communities, even as in urban areas, we're losing, not only in the US, but even here, people are losing their way from some of the traditional understanding and uh, traditional values. But the traditional practices, some of those are fading away. And um, it's my role to make sure that we can look at the past in order to understand the present and to make practical implications from that. So Ma'at for us has to be a practical concept where we're holding ourselves and everybody accountable. Otherwise it's not Ma'at, it's just something else. But Ma'at is balance. That is encouraging those to do well, continue to do well in the, in the uh, initiation scene It's a person becoming a respected uh, and protected ancestor and eventually some in that group will become an ak, 
and there's other people who uh, who have to pay a price because <laughs> they're out of line with their behavior, their conduct, their speech, their energy, whatever it may be. And uh, there was uh, there was a price for that group to pay. So that's uh, what I wanted to share with you, we'll say. And obviously, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to give you some insight about this elevated notion of uh, moral perfection and, um, and this great principle of ma'at that we have to make sure that we're implementing it on a regular and consistent basis. So um, thank you for listening. And um, I will join the live ceremony today if, uh, if I have a good connection. But if not, I see you uh, on the state side when I get back. All right, advancing the work.